Happy Friday, everyone, and thank you for joining us on Friday Okra, the public education podcast for Oklahomans. I'm Carrie Coppernell Jacobs with the Oklahoma Education Association. And I'm Alicia Priest, president of the OEA. Fried Okra is a weekly podcast where we get together to talk about public education issues in Oklahoma. We hope you'll join us every Friday. This morning, we are joined by State Superintendent Joy Hoffmeister. Superintendent, thank you for, uh, for taking time to visit with us today. Good. Well, it's great to be with you, Carrie and Alicia. I appreciate it. Um, we wanted to kind of kick off uh, a lot of districts went back to school this week um, in person, online. How did it go? You know, I think it's gone pretty well. We've heard from districts that uh, they have had students arriving wearing masks. Um, those schools that did require them are seem to be having success. Um, we do also know that there are other schools where uh, we did have some outbreaks um, mm -hmm. and then required quarantining. And uh, of course, that's what we were all hoping to avoid. Right. So, um so since we're talking about that back to school and, and we know that the governor signed an executive order about um, a monthly testing program that the state health department and the state department of education are supposed to be working on, what is the latest on that? Well, this was something um, that caught us a little by surprise. Um, I do want to underscore- Us too. <laughs> yeah, I want to underscore, it did say in the executive order that it is voluntary. So we have uh, regular meetings throughout the week and a standing meeting on Fridays at noon with the State Department of Health and their uh, top officials and leaders. Uh, so we are already and we're already working on uh, some of um, proposal that we think we can weave in to meet this executive order, which is uh, due on August the 23rd. Uh, what we're really more interested in is not a requirement that everyone be tested for a positive uh, case or not, because that's only as good as the day you test, right. uh, unless you're going to test every three days. Um, but perhaps there would be some that could be a part of what we call surveillance testing, which is looking for antibodies and how the antibodies are growing across populations. And that was something we were discussing earlier with what can we do that would be the least disruptive but provide the most information so that science yeah. can continue to lead decision making? And I haven't heard of that. It's really interesting. I've not heard of surveillance testing before. It's a different, yeah, I think a lot of people when the executive order came out, you know, everyone jumped to the conclusion of I have to be tested every month. You know, what's that going to do? So that's, I haven't heard of that before. That's interesting. Um, Let's talk also about um, personal protective equipment, PPE. Um, we know that some districts are able to provide their own. Some districts are still in need. Um, what's sort of the status of that? A lot of our districts have been using their CARES Act dollars uh, to make these kinds of uh, purchases. Some things are on back order. I do think though most of the cleaning supplies are already in. We've really seen our districts uh, plan in advance. That is, that's without question, they knew they were going to need and uh, are working toward that end. So we definitely wanna hear from districts that are still waiting on supplies. But um, so far what we do know is the Office of Emergency Management Mm -hmm. who is working to provide the distribution sites for all of the PPE that the governor uh, used some of his funds to help with schools having both uh, washable masks for teachers and for students. Um, of course, that's you know limited to two uh, per individual, but it's a start. And yet that's not all that's been provided. A lot of our districts had already made purchases. So this is a, a good reinforcement or um, perhaps um, an initial allocation of these PPEs. Uh, but we also know that, you know, those face shields, those clear face shields yeah. are really important. And uh, at the Department of Ed, we requested those for some of our uh, nurses, special education teachers, um, those teachers that are working with children that will be very close to them. Ideally, you want to wear a face shield and a mask mm -hmm. uh, that provides uh, full protection. And it's something that we know uh, what's optimal is that clear panel face mask for those teachers that are working with children 
uh, learning to read and um, those hard of hearing. Absolutely. I went to the dentist yesterday and my hygienist had on a mask with the uh, medical mask on top and a face shield. I mean, you know, wow. but they're right in, in where all the droplets are. So uh, we want to make sure that our educators, uh, our nurses, our support staff are safe. And, and part of that is um, having cleaning supplies. And so I've heard from um, teachers in, all across the state, from Muskogee to Skyatook to Northwest Oklahoma, that they've been told that they have to provide their own wipes and their own hand sanitizer. And you know how hard it is to find uh, cleaning supplies. And when you teach secondary and you have kids rotating in every hour, you have to clean every surface in between classes. Um, is there any chance that uh, through the state procurement system, we'd be able to, to get cleaning materials? That's certainly a request that is worthy of an answer. I don't know. I don't know what is available right now in any stockpiles. Um, I'm not sure about that, knowing that the hospitals are the ones that um, right. also are, are needing the, these resources. I have seen districts that are um, using those aerosol uh, foggers that can do this so rapidly. Uh, yeah. I'm familiar with those districts that have been planning ahead in that way, but it's disheartening to think about that landing on the you know shoulders of teachers and the need to give instruction. So that, that's troublesome for me to hear. Yeah, I uh, I heard from teacher two teachers just the day before yesterday that they were told in district meetings that uh, that they had to supply their own hand sanitizer and their own wipes, and um, and they're they're just beside themselves. Yeah. And these aren't small districts. They're, they're, you know, good sized districts. It's, I think this is the part that's, that scares our educators and why we push so hard to, you know, if we can't start safe and healthy, we shouldn't start, we should push the start date back or go virtual. Well, definitely we are uh, supportive of having safety protocols that fit the spread of the virus that you know, um, move up as the intensity of spread uh, increases across different communities or counties. Um, as you know, I did propose that, and yes. it is a baseline that could then be even tightened up uh, at the local district level, but that was uh, deemed too much of taking away local control by uh, the state board. And so for, uh, you know, me, I feel like the very, very basic has to be that everyone's wearing a mask. Um, the pediatricians, uh, the Oklahoma chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with their statement along with the family phys uh, practice physicians mm -hmm. and others and said, we really have to have masks everywhere in schools in order to uh, be able to stay open. You know, if yes. we're going back, we want our, yeah. our students, our families that they go home to, as well as of course, everyone serving in a school to be protected. And this is a bare minimum. In fact, I refer to mask wearing as the bedrock of all safety um, protocols. And then yes, washing hands, social distancing. Um, we, we know air um, ventilation is also very key. So all of that had to be, in my opinion, planned out and we needed a uniform plan, a state level response to a yes. state level public health crisis. You know, and I think that people want that. I mean, yeah. after, after the state board um, voted to make those recommendations instead of requirements, um, people were upset. Um, they were, they were um, you know, in some districts, you just have different district leadership across the state. And so some districts have already adopted those plans, your recommendation on their own. And said, you know what, we're going to do this anyway. Um, but there are many districts that are that are not. And I think that people were very hopeful that there would be a state level plan, a baseline that 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 they could fall back on. It's well, unfortunate. I appreciate that, and I do think that when we have 
Uh, now, given districts some time to implement, and we are seeing some of the um, disregard for the public health official in their area that yeah. give reports about uh, what their recommendation would be for a particular given time, let's say the opening of schools, um, that is a real concern for me. Um, I, I know that, that these are tough decisions and that everyone serving on a, on a school board is put in a very difficult place, but we have to listen to science and we have to listen to those who are uh, health experts that we lean on at the local county level um, and then at the state level. Uh, and, and if not, it's going to mean that there's going to be a start and a swift stop. And yeah. I am very concerned because disruption is not good for kids and continuity in learning. And, and I understand why some of the largest districts have made decisions to begin their first nine weeks with a virtual start, um, not because they wanted to, but sure. because yeah. it showed them that that's the decision they needed to make at the time. You know, as a parent, I, I completely appreciate that. I've already been contacted by uh, one of my daughter's teachers to check in and make sure that we have home internet access and, and you know, they have a checklist of things, I guess, that they're asking every family as they call home. And, um, and, and I appreciate that because one, I know that they value my child and their, um, and their staff's uh, health and that they're listening to the medical experts. We didn't go to school. I mean, you know, teachers get second guessed all the time. Oh, are they, you know, are, is that the right method that they should be using? You know, what, what are they teaching my kid? And now our medical experts know what we've been experiencing with everybody second guessing our methods. And, and we went to school they went to school to do what, what they're doing and have studied and are, are recommending safety protocols to keep, to keep our citizens and especially our children safe. And, uh, and, and we appreciate everything that you have been trying to do to, uh, to mitigate the spread in our schools and through our staff. I, I just, those decisions have to weigh heavy and, um, and it's beyond a one person's opinion about whether uh, politics or science are real. We have to listen to the experts. Boy, I agree. And, and we also have to be flexible and be ready to pivot because we know that science is still investigating the coronavirus. It is so new. We are going to be learning in real time and developing evidence. And so we have to be able to pivot to what the science points to as uh, the, the right methods uh, with you know, safety protocols or um, other, other things that might seem to be contradictory or change over time. It's based in science and that's what we'll continue to bring to people. But this is different than what we've ever experienced. It's new to the world yeah. and we're gonna learn from each other. We don't wanna be the case uh, or the state that doesn't get it right and everyone else learns from our mistake. Uh, we've got to be a state that really works closely with our public health officials, the scientists, our, our epidemiologists, and, and that we as are communicating to our families that we are planning ahead with lots of different uh, plans for different scenarios and we'll be ready to pivot and shift to those, but that we need to embrace some of what we know clearly without a question. Masks can help us simulate the herd immunity that is gained when we do have a vaccine. And so everyone's talking about we're waiting for a vaccine, but if both the, the wearer and those around one another, you know, in crowds are all wearing masks in a school, we can achieve that level uh, that is achieve with a vaccine. And so this is very powerful if we all wear masks correctly and um, keep them on. Uh, we can crush the virus and that's what we've got to do. So that not just we open school and that we give our kids what we know is an optimal um, learning environment, but that we are able to stay open, 
and crush the virus. So for those communities where we don't have the ability to go back to school face to face right now, uh, we need to step it up so we can. So what, um, you know, you use the word pivot and right now I think teachers and support staff are, are absolutely pivoting and they have been learning and relearning and planning and changing. And what message do you have for our, our folks in schools right now? What do you want teachers and support staff to know? Well, I, first of all, I want them to know they are on the front lines. They are our treasured uh, experts in learning that we have worked very hard to build the um, pipeline, if you will, of educators, and I want to protect them. I want to make sure that we don't have terribly difficult decisions having to be made in the personal lives of teachers, of choosing what they're called to do with the uh, decision to retire early because of fear and uh, because of the need to protect their own families out of an abundance of caution because they don't have that confidence at their own school. And those are choices that we don't want te people to have to make. And it's not just teachers, it's all of those who support learning, who are working in cafeterias, who are working in a, the, it, actually in a lot of support capacity that uh, we can't have school without these individuals there. And, and it's not a place where um, we want just anyone. We want people who have a heart to be there, who have been um, professionally uh, trained and received um, a lot of expertise over time. Um, we need to do everything we can to protect that opportunity for our teachers to stay right here um, and, and be able to deliver that. I think the second thing I would say is you know, a lot of our families are remembering the spring and the distance learning that we had then is not what we are providing and right. proposing for today. Um, I think that's really lost right now in the, the public um, discourse. We've, we've got to be able to talk about the difference. And yeah. this, this time in the fall, we now have had many months to prepare to secure robust online uh, curriculum, as well as a platform to deliver those lessons that are um, developed with the teachers in the very districts that our children are enrolled in, and, and that align with academic standards here in Oklahoma. And these are times where grades will be taken. Um, there will be a assessing of learning and where children are, and we've got to know that now. Uh, we cannot say that paper packets are okay. Right. They may be a very temporary uh, solution on a day or two or something sure. If, sure. if caught off guard. But my goodness, what we have now is so different. And parents should feel more confident about what our schools are about to deliver in a virtual setting. We're taking grades. We're taking attendance. We are moving the curriculum forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And our kids have lost a lot of learning. Um, there's been unfinished learning that we have not been able to complete. And, and it's more important now than ever that parents stay engaged, whether they are dropping their child off at the door of the schoolhouse or whether they are helping make sure that student is um, online and connected with the teachers virtually. Or if you're like my household, you're engaged involuntarily because we're all just there together. So we appreciate your time very much, Superintendent, and um, thank you for thank you for keeping everyone um, everyone's safety in mind. We appreciate it. Well, I thank you, and I thank all of our teachers and those who are supporting our students in schools. And they are what school is about. It it cannot happen without each of these individuals. And they are making an impact that is immeasurable. And I am very, very grateful, so thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. All right, take care. 
Hello everyone, I'm Carrie Coppernall Jacobs with the Oklahoma Education Association. Thank you for joining us for a special video version of the Fried Okra podcast. And I'm Alicia Priest and we are here with uh, speech pathologist and author extraordinaire, Dennis Matthew. Dennis, welcome to Fried Okra. Thanks for having me, guys. I don't know if I'm uh, author extraordinaire, but uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate the kind words. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. So tell us a little bit about um, your journey to becoming an author. We know you've been in the classroom, you're a speech pathologist. Um, so this all sort of seems like it weaves together. Talk about how you decided to write a book. I mean, that's a big undertaking, a book for any age. Yeah, so a little bit about myself, um, Dennis Matthew, my degree in education is in speech pathology, uh, a profession in which, you know, you are um, helping children discover their voice, um, if you will, um, their purpose, their song. Um, so professionally, I've, uh, you know, I'm going into my 13th, 14th year of being a speech therapist. Uh, kind of plugging back into helping students discover their voice, their song, their purpose, their place in life, that kind of a thing. Um, you know, I'm from, uh, like I was telling you uh, when we were getting ready uh, for this call, I'm, I'm from, um, and by from, I mean born in the UAE, but I'm of uh, South Indian heritage. So my parents are from South India. They migrated to the United Arab Emirates for employment purposes. And I was born in the capital, Abu Dhabi. And uh, I did about 11 to 12 years of my life there. Uh, so elementary schooling, middle schooling, um, very diverse city. So I, I've been very fortunate to grow around a lot of cultural diversity. UAE is a, uh, a very diverse city where, uh, you know, ethnicities, uh, people from all over the world come yeah. for different purposes. So kind of growing up around diversity was the norm for me. It always intrigued me to just get to know another people group. Uh, hear all these beautiful languages, starting with Arabic, and then, you know, um, just English was just one of the many languages that we heard. Um, so, grew up in the UAE. Uh, high school did, did that in South India, so Kerala is the exact state. Um, so, about 9, 10, 11, 12, so those four grades in South India. And then, when I was done with education, with, with high schooling, you know, I, my plans were, was to continue in India with my, you know, post-secondary kind of college journey and my dad just pitched to me the idea of hey what about the U.S. and uh, because I've always been um, you know a proponent of traveling and experiencing different cultures I was like okay sure why not and so my mom's side of the family at that point had been in the U.S. for over two decades and so there was some you know footing here and I thought okay well let's let's go to this place called Edmond Oklahoma or Mustang Oklahoma and uh, it, it just all seemed very surreal and, you know, um, you know, like a story out of some, some fiction novel kind of thing uh, to hear about this, you know, to hear of a place called the United States of America, but have no, you know, real concrete idea what, what this place looked like other than what you saw in movies and TV shows and things of that sure. nature. So yeah. It was kind of cool to come and, you know, immerse myself in this brand new culture um, and, you know, sort of start my journey towards becoming an American, became, an, became a citizen in 2010, you know, so all through that, went to UCO for my bachelor's and master's in speech path, speech pathology, started student teaching in Mustang, which then the, the school that I student taught at, uh, I got hired there full time. So even before I graduated, I, I was offered a job and I worked in Mustang for many years, went on to work in more schools one year, uh, then went to the East Coast after I met my amazing wife. We now have a daughter who just turned a year and a half. It was mm -hmm. in my, you know, four years or so in the Boston area that I decided to kind of press play on this long, you know, time dream that I had of becoming a children's author. What actually inspired me to become a children's author was working in Mustang Creek Elementary. Mustang Creek, the school that I student taught in, Mm -hmm. which then, you know became my job uh the years that i was there the seven years that i was there in mustang creek mustang creek was this magical place to me mm -hmm. i felt like any child that walked in through the doors of mustang creek felt empowered um they were taught to spread their wings you know and fly uh with boldness with courage and so i wanted to kind of create this magical place in a book uh, that could allow children to kind of 
um, travel. You know, uh, the minute they opened this book, they would be taken away into this magical place that reminded me of Mustang Creek, but they would be using their imagination to do so. So this seed was kind of planted when I worked in Mustang Creek. This was back in 2007, but the book didn't get actually written or I only started writing the book in 2017, some 10 years later. Wow. Because it was one of those things where I was like, yeah, someday I'll write a book. Someday I'll write yeah. a book. You know, it started out as someday and then weeks went by, months went by, years went by. Yeah. And always in the back of my mind, I, I knew there was this idea on the shelf. Um, but years later, I want to say it was 2016, I think, there was a period of time where I was unemployed in the Boston area, could not find work, which is something I had never dealt with in, in my yeah. career. Yeah. I had never had to put a resume out because right. I was very fortunate to, you know, get jobs. Now I was in a situation where, man, I was sending resume after resume, reaching out to, you know, recruiters and nothing was coming. And so wow. I've always been this creature of activity. Like I can't sit still. I've got to like do something with my hands, with my mind. And so that's when, you know, because of urgency, I was like, well, I've got nothing else going on. Let me just start writing. Uh, and so that's how Bello the Cello, um, my first book, got compiled into a Word document. And then from there on, I, you know, by the grace of God, I just kind of figured everything out, out as I went. And as soon as that little Word document was typed up, I got on Google and I searched for a writing coach because I knew I had written in my, I, you know, I write in my journal, my diary, but not professionally. I know the marketplace is looking for something that's a little more you know, um, aesthetically pleasing, you know, if you will, uh, cosmetically approved for the market, you know. So I reached out to a writing coach that I found on, on Google. And I, you know, I picked up my phone, called her, she answered. I was like, out of the blue, I'm, I'm this guy that's trying to write a book. I need a writing coach. Can you help me? And she was like, yeah, sure. Send me over your script. I did. In a couple of days, she connected me with a writing coach out of Austin, Texas. Um, send my script to him. He edited it and he said, you know what, dude, I think this is ready to be put on the market. Do you have a publisher? And I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, I'm an independent publisher. I would love to sign you on. I think this book has, can, can add some value to the kid lit space. I was like, okay. Um, and that's, that's how, say what? That's a lot of trust. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was that, yeah. it was that or, yeah, it was that or go back to sitting on my couch, right? Doing nothing. Yeah. So it was this, but I feel like a lot of times for me, that was true for writing a book. I feel like a lot of times, a lot of us have to find ourselves in that our backs up against the wall. We're in a corner. We don't have any other choice. I feel like creativity is, is often born under pressure or those, those great decisions. I feel like we always look back on are often born in high pressure situations because we have to make a choice. You know what I mean? I think, I think that that's sort of like, that is where we are in education right now. Everybody's backs are against the wall and we're like, creativity is happening. Yeah. I mean, like no other time, you know, again, very fortunate to say that I've been in education for some 14 years, like no other time in the last decade and a half, um, I'm seeing educators, come out of their comfort zones to try anything that will work to yeah. collaborate across disciplines and some beautiful things are happening. Um, and I think it is, it is so sad to say that it has taken, uh, you know, it's, it's sad to say it's bittersweet to say that it has taken a pandemic to make us think outside the box. Right. But I think, um, we will look back and I think we've already started to kind of look back on this period that is tough for all of us yeah. and we're seeing some of the beautiful things that are coming out right and where we're adapting we're learning to be flexible um, and I feel like that's that's a lot of our stories go ahead so no I was going to ask about so your your background in speech pathology how how did that or did it come into play when you are choosing words for your for your books like how does that integrate with what with what you are writing the word choice that you have so I'm, I'm a big proponent of writing a book for the classroom so what i mean by that is i'm very big on vocabulary enrichment i'm very big on writing scripts that demand children to think at a higher level 
mm. whether that's critical thinking skills, comprehension skills, reasoning skills, prediction skills, right? Um, I'm, 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 one of my pet peeves is to, now that I'm a children's author, I get to look through a lot of books because authors send me books to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, look through them, endorse them, promote them, that kind of a thing. And one of my biggest pet peeves is, is opening a book and not seeing depth i.e. If, if a child was to read this book, it would in no way challenge or cognitive, cognitively stretch the child, right? Those stretch the child's cognitive muscles. If a child can open a book and come across a word that's unfam uh, unfamiliar to them and prompts the question of, Miss so-and-so, can you please help me say this word? Or Mr. Yeah. So-and-so, what is the meaning of this word? Yeah. Those are incidental learning opportunities, right? And at the end of the day, we want books to be gateways. Uh, to like basically open minds, uh, help our children to spread their wings of imagination, if you will. So I have so many parents who have given me feedback on the book and, and, and said, wow, you have a lot of big words in your book. And, I've, and I've, I've always been consistent with the message of saying, those are planted there with intention, right? Because when I do an author visit, we're doing things like phonemic awareness. We're doing things like the number of syllables in these big words. I've had many students in a presentation say, Mr. Matthew, what is the meaning of that word? And I love getting those questions yeah. because then it helps me to create learning opportunities. Um, if I'm asking, a, if I'm giving the definition of a word, then I might ask that child to put that word in a sentence. Can you use it in a context, right? Those kinds of things. Those are the kinds of books that I love to write. And especially now with the, you know, the climate and education that's, that's making a big emphasis on social emotional learning, um, I feel like that's also a big part of my books. I, I write about emotions a lot and I write to make students aware of themselves and their surroundings. One of the things that I love about your books is that your books are reflective of our classrooms. Any, any child of any race can open up your book and see themselves in that book. And, um, and I think that is so important for our students to be able to see themselves in the literature that they're reading. Um, talk about that process as you're, you know, as you find illustration to go with, with your books. Yeah, um, identity affirmation is just a big uh, part of why I write. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, um, I think it's one of, we all know that the who's, the who's who, the Hall of Famers of history, culture, you know, we, we, we let our children know who is celebrated in a culture by showing them in our literature, right? So when children see that men and women who look like them, um, men and women from diverse backgrounds are celebrated in literature. It is our way of, um, you know, if not explicitly, even, even indirectly, subliminally between the lines telling them, you know, who you are matters. We are celebrating you by celebrating your diversity in this literature. So uh, I don't know if that made sense. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, so, you know, one of, one of the one of the best questions that I often get, I mean, we we already had it in our pre prep uh, talk. Getting the question, "Where are you from?" I love it because when people ask me, "Where, where are you from?" I, ten out of ten times, my mind does not come up with a clear answer uh, because I feel like, man, I there are parts of me that belong to different parts of this world. Um, like, div I feel like diversity is very much a very much the essence of who I am. That's just I believe that's how God made me that like anytime I go into a community, I just try to become one with them. Right. So born in Abu Dhabi, man, even to this day, when I hear anybody walking by speaking in Arabic, like my ears just perk up, like, like how beautiful the language is. Right. And then I lived in India, took on that culture, came to the U S I've, I've done my best to like adapt to this culture, but then I've also had the privilege and the honor of like having, you know, I've, I've traveled to Haiti, Mexico, Africa, like, and wherever I go, people always think I'm one of the locals. Like when I'm in, when I'm in Haiti, they did not suspect me for a tourist. They thought, oh, I'm a Haitian, right? When I was in Mexico, they thought I was Mexican. When, when, I, was in, when I was in Kenya, they thought I was Kenyan. And 
I don't know, some people might take offense to that, but I loved it. I loved that the locals saw themselves in me, yeah. right? So like diversity is just like very much ingrained into who I am. So I think just like being a speech therapist flows into my writing, I celebrate diversity in, 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 in a huge way in my books. Um, to, to the point where diversity is kind of the norm in my writing, right? Nobody kind of sticks out. Um, like everybody is just unique in their own ways. And I want children to open my books and go, oh, everybody's bringing something to the table, right? Maybe I have something to bring to the table too, right? And, and, and when we celebrate that in literature, we are letting children know that there is no part of them that they've got to check at the door or leave at the door, yeah. especially as it matters to race, ethnicity, skin color, culture of heritage. We're like, that's, you know, the way I write is, is my way of letting students know, hey, kiddo, who you are down to ethnicity, heritage, the families that you were raised up in, all of that has beauty. Bring all of that to the table. Let's learn from each other. If we don't incorporate that diversity into our books, and if, if our books, as far as cultures of heritage, ethnicity, histories are concerned, if they're all monochromatic and one dimensional, um, we, can, we, we can beat the drum of all children matter all day long. But if children don't see themselves in the content that they're studying um, or the content that they're reading, uh, subconsciously, we will condition them to believe um, that we don't see them for who they are as far as their cultures, their ethnicities, their racial heritage, or, or you, you get what I'm saying. So yeah. that's just a big value of, mine and I, a value of mine, and I bring that to my writing. Hope I'm not talking too much. But. No, no. no. Really so interesting. Great, great so, discussion point. But I, wanna, I wanted to ask you also about, I know we have lots of questions, so I'll try to keep it. No, ask away, ask away. Okay. But when you are, um, you know, as, an, as a children's author, I imagine you do lots of classroom visits. Now I know that it's a little different. Um, do you, what, when you go to classrooms and do like a book reading and then talk to the kids, what do you want them to get out of that? Or what have you gotten out of that? Oh man, like, so all the, you know, I always have an agenda when I start a presentation, you know, like a, a big thing is, here, let me put it this way. When, when teachers or when students ask me, what is your mission as an author? I always say, I write to the underdog in the classroom, right? And here's why. Uh, students will ask me, Mr. Matthew, what inspires you to write? And I always tell children, self-reflection is a, is a big tool for me uh, from where I draw inspiration to write. So a lot of the characters that you meet in my books are very much you know, composites, fragments, segments, parts of Dennis Matthew, uh, right? So Bello struggling to find a song is very much young Dennis Matthew that you're meeting in that book, um, right? My wild first day of school is all about Dennis Matthew. Young Dennis Matthew was a wild child, right? <laughs> and a lot of his wildness was, you know, subtle ways of trying to figure out where do I fit in? right? I am, yeah. I am wild in my own ways because I haven't quite figured out my lane. Um, so I look back at my own life and I pick chapters, right? Um, and I, I use those for books. So when students ask me, who do you write to? What's your mission as an author? I always say I write to the underdog in the classroom because again, I've, I've, growing up, I always felt like I was the underdog in any scenario. Classroom, did not play any sports, um, if you put me on a stage, I would cry. I didn't <laughs> matter if I was eight, nine, ten. Um, I was that kid that, that was very self-conscious, did not, did not know who to make friends with, always got in trouble, right? I would, uh, and, and a, lot of, a lot of my, you know, I would always be, not always, but I would often be in the principal's office because I lashed out at somebody or got into a fight or whatever. Again, because that was how I was coping with not being able to fit in as a child. Elementary school, middle school was just horrible because I just did not know where to fit in. Yeah. So I take that message into the classroom because there are underdogs in the classroom who have kind of counted them, themselves out of the conversation. They're like, I'm not good enough to belong in this group. Um, you know, I'm not good at sports. I'm not popular. I don't know what my skills are. That's fellow the cello. Yeah. That's my story. So 
to the student, I always say, I'm, I'm here to encourage the kid that feels like he or she does not have anything to bring to the table. Because my message through Bellow is, guess what? It took me a few decades, but Mr. Dennis eventually started figuring out, oh, you know what? He, I am kind of good at a few things. And then come to find out, I'm, I'm good at quite a few things, right? Yeah. Um, you know, initially, it was just, oh, I can sing. Then it was, oh, I can write. Oh, I can play an instrument, right? And oh, I'm a speech pathologist too. And so my message to kiddos, uh, uh, you know, is even if it takes you some time, like a lot of years kind of time, don't give up on yourself. You will eventually discover what you're good at. And I feel like that message is true for adults. Right. Too. I was just going to say, will you come and give me this pep talk every morning, please? <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, I need this individual like motivation in my life. It's really funny <laughs> how even into our, I don't want to say old age, but I'm 38 years old. And even now I find myself being young Dennis in, you know, certain aspects of my life. There, there are moments in the day where I'll catch young Dennis in my mind, right? Processing life as young Dennis would. So yes, these messages are absolutely appropriate for our, our grownups too, I feel. Now, when a teacher asks me, what's your goal as, a, as an author, I always say, I want to be the classroom teacher's author. As in, when a classroom teacher opens my book, you know, ideas for lesson plans need to be popping out, right? I don't want my books to just be a surface level, wafer thin, quick read, you know, a quick feel good book, but I want there to be depth in my books, um, depth to where students are wanting to ask the teacher why and how, why not kind of um, deeper, higher level thinking kind of question. So that's kind of, those are my goals when I go into a school uh, to do visits and author presentations. Now, have I know that you've been working on a CD with music. So how's that going? Is that about ready to come out? Yeah, it's, it's a few days away from going live. Again, oh, yeah. you, know, you know what's real? Again, talking about how urgency gives birth to creativity. The whole reason why I started writing music is because of the pandemic. Um, because again, wait, time out. I'm sorry. This is like your pandemic. You picked this up, hobby. I picked <laughs> up eating cereal a lot. Like <laughs> what? So, so here's, I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to say live in the moment, real time. You know, what lessons can I learn in the real time kind of guy? So I'm going to give you a little story. I'm, I'm very much a creature of comfort and habit. Um, if I can just you know, my, my uh, method of operation, my MO is if I can pick one thing that's working for me and if I can keep that working forever, I will just stick to it. I'm, I'm not one to kind of branch out and try new things by nature unless there is a, a, a precipitating event that kind of kicks me out of my routine, right? So with Bellow, I told you unemployment is what forced me to write and it just bloomed into this um, full-time gig, so to speak. Okay, I was in Jenks, Oklahoma, doing an author visit. I think it was about my 10th or 12th visit. In the last year or so, by the grace of God, I think I've presented to about 100 schools. Oh, my word. Uh, I've read Bellow the Cello to some 35 to 40,000 students worldwide. Um, so, wow, what a journey, right? And a hard journey, a hard journey, okay? Yeah where I'm, I'm counting, uh, like I'm earning every moment that's rewarding, right? And at the end of the day, that's what you want a, a rewarding journey to be like. You've got to be able to count the expense, right? People from the outside look in and go, wow, like piece of cake. He's just rocking it out. Like, but, but friends don't know the amount of hours that are put in. And that's true for our hardworking teachers, right? Teacher of the right. year of the district, teacher of the state, whatever, from the outside, when you walk across that stage and take that trophy or award or whatever, it's your moment to shine. But the general public, that only that teacher knows how hard they've been working for every single child, right? It's kind of similar. Anything that's rewarding, man, you, you've got to like pay, pay your dues, so to speak. So long story short, I'm in Jinx about my 12th visit. I had a great day of visits. Um, met, met with a few hundred students and I'm about to walk out and I love the librarian. Um, you know, I had, because it was one of my first 
visits, I told her, hey, listen, if you can give me any feedback, honest, corrective things that I can tweak, because you're seeing authors all the time. I'm still new to this. As I'm walking out, I sold a bunch of books. As I'm walking out, literally the last thing she says before I walk out, she was like, great, amazing book, great energy. You have a great way of connecting with kids, great presentation. But I still felt like my intuition was telling me that you're still missing something in your presentation. She's telling me this. And so I was like, okay. So I'm driving back right from Jenks to Mustang is a couple of hours. So I'm driving and I'm going, okay, I know she was trying to help me, but man, that, you know how it is. Like people can tell you nine things that are great and they tell you one thing to work on. I don't know about you, but I latch onto that one thing. I, you know, that the two hours I was sitting on that one thing going, gosh, well, that evening or that week, I should say, our little baby was teething and she was having these days where she was just struggling to go to sleep. Yeah. And it's all routine that usually when I put her to sleep, I'm always singing something to her. I'm making a song up. I'm singing a hymn, whatever. Well, that evening as I'm putting her to sleep, I sing, what's bothering you? What's bothering you? That tune just came to me. And as I'm singing, you know, the words just came, I want to hear all about it. So I started singing this melody and I had my aha moment where I was like, oh, what if you just brought music into schools? That, that's like a no brain, right? So as I'm putting her to sleep, I'm singing, singing to her. She's like calming down, listening to, listening to the song. She's a year and a half uh, now. She now sings the words to the song, um, uh -huh. right? Yeah, so it's really funny how Bello the Cello is about a cello's lullaby. And here I am singing a new lullaby that I just in, in the moment came upon. That's the first song that I started singing in schools. And it is, man, to the point where schools were like, we love you, we love your books, but your, but your songs are what we really want, right? That's where, that's where my visits got to. So I started traveling with my guitar. So the pandemic hits, all of my visits come to a halt. Sure. And so I had the choice of either panicking That's or like, yeah, <laughs> like, or <laughs> like, like I did back when Bella was written, when I had my unemployment moment, I had, you know, I was like, okay, Dennis, make a choice in this high pressure situation. How are you going to use your time to your advantage? Are you going to just mope around? Cause you lost, you know, because about 25 schools had to cancel. Yeah. You know, or I asked myself, you're going to use this to your advantage. And about, in, in a matter of three to four weeks, about seven songs just got written. No way. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm putting it on YouTube. I'm getting feedback from educators saying, wow, this is an amazing song. This is an amazing song. Then come to find out one of my buddies who lives two streets down, he's a producer. He's got a studio at home. So I'm like, dude, can you like produce some music for me? He was like, yeah. So in, a, in, in the last month or so, you know, um, well, long story short, the album is 99% ready. Uh, I've, been share, I've been sharing little snippets with Alicia and, you know, um, and I've been just getting a lot of positive feedback. So yeah, got, got music content coming out. And um, what I've been telling educators is all of my music is, is very big on social emotional learning, all about character, affirmation, purpose, building the child. Um, so yeah, about seven songs. The actual album uh, has 14 tracks. It's seven songs. And for each song, I have a little pep talk uh, right before. Oh my song. gosh, this is for me <laughs> in the mornings. <laughs> yeah. um, um, Dennis, where, um, where can our listeners or viewers uh, go to get your books, Bella the Cello and Wild First Day of School, and eventually your CD? Yeah, so booksbydennis.com is uh, where they'll be, be able to get all my content. I want to say the music will, should be live beginning of next week. So booksbydennis.com is where they'll get to buy it. But it'll, it'll also be on iTunes and Spotify and all that good stuff. Um, yeah, so. Awesome. That is well, fantastic. We appreciate your time. Uh, you're a very busy person. I'm also 38 and feeling like I really need to be doing something. Stop it, stop it. You're doing uh, So <laughs> we, but we appreciate your work and, and, um, and you are one of our readers uh, during the original shutdown. We appreciate your time then as well. So uh, good luck on everything. We appreciate it.
Thank you so much. Hope I didn't talk your ear off. I can, you know, I'm a speech pathologist, so I talk. (laughs) Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. And welcome to Alicia's Morning Announcements. Do, 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 do. Um, we, we don't want to pay for the extra, you know, uh, music right there. So I just do it myself. We're All free. right. On Tuesday, August 18th, that is the last day to register for absentee ballots um, and for the primary runoff on August 25th. So make sure that your vote counts. If you're going to request an absentee ballot, make sure that you get it back in the mail. We know that there are um, folks that don't approve of mail-in ballots and they're slowing down the mail and your vote has to be in by August 25th at five o'clock. So if you're going to use the mail system and do absentee voting, which we believe is a right that all people should have, um, then make sure that you get it in the mail in a timely fashion. Um, On August 20th, we are having a um, a listening tour for Kendra Horn. She's having an education town hall, wants to hear education issues. And so we invite, uh, we invite everybody to uh, come on that uh, in CD5. So it's, it's specifically designated for CD5 folks, but if you are, want to hop on and listen to what Kendra Horn has to say, please do so. Our summer conference videos, if you signed up for um, summer conference and you didn't get to attend sessions because you had other things going on, um, plus some of the sessions were at the same time and they were fantastic and how can one decide? So you can go um, to the members only session section of our website, okea.org and um, click on the members only section. Put it, You have to put in your membership ID. There's a process to do, but members only can get on and watch those summer conference videos. There was great professional development. So I hope you'll take the opportunity and do some of your own professional development by watching those videos. Yeah. Um, All kinds of good stuff there. Uh, And those will be up uh, today. And uh, I want to say happy retirement to Bill Guy, Oklahoma City Metro organizer, and Marty Bull, our Tulsa Metro organizer. They retired um, just in the near past. And we are excited to welcome Brianna Flatley and Brendan Jarvis. Brianna is going to be the Oklahoma City Metro um, organizer, and uh, she comes to us from, uh, from a education position in Bethany and Brendan Jarvis is going to be the Tulsa Metro organizer and he comes to us from uh, Union uh, Public Schools from um, from their education association so we are super excited to uh, have two new staff members come on and um, they're gonna hit the ground running in these times and yeah <laughs> welcome here are 70,000 things to do yeah um, man it's I mean Bill and Marty, those are both huge shoes to fill and just a lifetime of experience. And I'm super pumped about um, our new colleagues. They are both such high quality people. It's going to be great. So yay. Welcome. So, all right. Well, thank you for joining us today on Fried Okra, the public education podcast for Oklahomans. I'm Carrie Copernell Jacobs with the Oklahoma Education Association. And I'm Alicia Priest, president of the OEA. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review Fried Okra on Apple Podcasts. You can also contact us at friedokrapodcast at gmail.com. We hope you'll join us again next week. Until then, keep fighting the good fight for public education.